أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم قالوا أئنك لأنت يوسف قال أنا يوسف وهذا أخي قد من الله علينا إنه من يتق ويصبر فإن الله لا يضيع أجر المحسنين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي فالحمد لله والصلاه والسلام على رسول الله وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين اما بعد يوسف عليه السلام told his brothers or asked his brothers a question without telling them that he is their brother he turned to them and he said do you know did you know what you had done to yusuf and his brother at the time when you were so outrageous so out of control so not under control, not keeping your emotions, your rage, your hatred under control. This is the question that he posed to them, إِذْ أَنْتُمْ جَاهِلُونَ Now I want you to imagine what's going on in their head. How are they processing this statement? So, wait, how do you know who Yusuf is again? This is what's going on in their head. How, do you, how does he know that name? And uh, how do you know that we did anything? Our dad didn't even find out what we did. How do you know what we did? And how do you know what we've done to his brother all along? And how do you know the state we were in when we were doing that to Yusuf? We didn't quietly kill him or quietly do something with him. We acted jahil towards him. We were you know, aggressive towards him. And then we tossed him in a well. How do you know that we were acting in this way? And we had these comments and these sentiments. Who? There was no other witness. Nobody else. Wait, hold on a second. He was so interested in having us come and explain ourselves and tell us all about the family. He was so generous to us, overwhelmingly generous, doubled up our load without even telling us and returned our money. He was so interested in seeing Binyamin. Now pieces are starting to get put together. And, you know, they have these things in... Uh, now, they have these optical illusions So you'll look at an image And it'll be a bunch of squares, right? And they'll say, find the circle And you're like, there's no circles here, it's just squares And you have to look at it a certain way And inside the pattern you'll discover There's two ways of looking at it It's an optical illusion So at first glance you saw squares And another, you your eyes focus on something else And all of a sudden you see a circle, right? Um, there are the filmmakers do this sometimes like they'll um, they'll make a film where there's a story and you're following along the story and all of a sudden something completely unrelated happens. Sheikh Suhib was telling me about a story, they, a, a movie they made about a, a school shooting, some some kid who went about on a rampage, you know, shooting people in a school. And the whole movie was just about a boy and a girl or some other story. And all of a sudden, randomly, this is happening. And then you find out, if you go back in the movie, there's the main scene, like the camera captures the characters talking. But in the background, there's always this kid looking up things about guns or he's doing other things. And the whole movie, they're telling you this is always there, but your eyes never went to it because you're, you're focused on the main scene. You're not looking at the background. There's these breadcrumbs, breadcrumbs that were always there, right? So the idea being that Yusuf Harisam was right in their face from the beginning. They've had a few encounters with him. But they never looked at him from that point of view because they weren't really looking. And this is yet another indication that when dad said, go seek out Yusuf and his brother, that wasn't really on their mind seeking out Yusuf. Because there were enough clues to start landing at the fact that that in fact is Yusuf. But when Yusuf spoke and said, do you know what you did? And Ibn Ashur rahimahullah, even postulates that when they said, we, you know, we, we've come with just stuff from our home that we can't even sell. Please be charitable towards us. And Yusuf is up there on the throne, right? And they're way down here and there's guards and this is a giant hall and things like that. So you're maybe 20, 30 feet away from the, the his highness that you're talking to. He's not exactly on like cler a clerical chair. Like you go to the you know motor vehicle office or some other office and the clerk is right across from you across the desk. It's not like that. He's, he's in the royal position. And they're down there at the bottom. So he's up there on the throne. But it seems maybe perhaps that Yusuf came down from the throne and approached them and kind of looked them in the eye and said, do you know what you did with Yusuf and his brothers? His brother, when you were jahil? And as his, his face came closer, 
they're looking at it and all these thoughts, these like trickle by trickle realizations are hitting them in the in the face and all of a sudden, قالوا, that's where the ayah begins. قالوا, la anta Yusuf? And this is hard to translate. Like literal translations are terrible. You certainly are Yusuf. No, 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 no. You? For real? You're, you really are Yusuf? Are you really Yusuf? <laughs> They're in absolute shock. That's why the word anta is used twice. Now, inna is typically for beginner Arabic students. We translate inna as certainly or without a doubt, etc. It's a it's a word used for tawqid, but its original rhetorical purpose, its most common rhetorical purpose is called izalatu shak, to remove doubt. And in a, if I were to suggest a translation for inna kala anta yusuf, it would have to have the word really, not certainly in it. Are, are you really Yusuf? And another qira'ah, another reading of the same ayah is that it's not a it's not a question at all. It's in the affirmative. You really are Yusuf. You. That's that's how they put this. And there's the the emphatic inna, which I'm translating as really, and then the lam, which is yet another really. It's another job. Oh my God. Seriously, you. And the the use are twice. The seriously and the really is twice. And then they say the word Yusuf. And it, the shock has hit them. Now, Mufassirun tried to, you know, scholars of Quran tried to analyze, well, how did they come to the realization that this is Yusuf, right? And what I started today with is when Yusuf salam, basically gave them the ultimate bread crumb by saying, do you know what you did with Yusuf and his brother? Well, nobody knew what they did except for the only witnesses around were Yusuf and the, the brothers. So if all of us are here and none of us snitched, that the only possibility left is Yusuf, right? It's going to take a little bit of slow turning of the wheels to process, you know. But it's almost, <laughs> Sheikh Suhaib said this jokingly, and I told him I won't say this in the lecture, but I can't help myself. Can you imagine how awkward it would have been if they didn't believe him? <laughs> like if he said, I am Yusuf, and they were like, ah, yeah, <laughs> that's good one, King. That's pretty good. <laughs> Ooh, that would have been awkward. My God, can you even imagine if? <laughs> but the shock has now hit them. That is, it. they haven't confirmed this. They can't believe what they're seeing, so they're posing it actually as a question. And even if it is a statement, you really are Yusuf. It's kind of like you're Yusuf, right? Are you? And that's the question that's been posed now. The the scholars tried to answer this question differently. I tried to answer this question as it started dawning on them when he posed this question to them, and that made them realize the train of thought made them realize, oh my god, it's our brother, the one we threw in the well. They have other explanations that are not exactly taken from the text, but they're found classically. One is when he smiled, his smile gave him away. They recognized his smile. I have a couple of problems with that as not necessarily that are rejected, but I find it less convincing because this is not a situation where he's smiling. That's number one. Uh, number two, I don't think that they, around him he had much reason to smile when he was with them. So I don't know if they recognize his smile so much. So th that makes me less convinced of that. And then the others is that they say he took his crown off and he had a birthmark on his forehead and they recognize the birthmark uh, on the forehead, which is again... Possible, but I don't see that there's a reason to explain it this way when the text is giving you enough reasons to real to, to understand that it dawned on them when he posed that question. That question made it all too obvious that he in fact is uh, Yusuf alayhi salam. Now, as he is going to respond, Qala, Ana Yusuf, I am Yusuf. Wahada Akhi, and this is my brother. Well, who's he referring to? This is my brother, Binyamin. But now the, the first thing, Anna Yusuf, I am confirming that I am Yusuf. Right? I am Yusuf. You should think what happens, what is the effect, not only on the speaker, but what is the effect on the listener? The audience may be in shock. But moreover, the last encounter they had with this same man, they called him a thief. These same people that came begging to him said that brother of ours used to have a brother that was a thief too. Remember, you know, right? 
So he had a, a brother that he had that used to steal before him. And who was that brother? Yusuf. Asarraha Yusuf fi nafsi. Yusuf swallowed it at, at the time. He swallowed the response. You know who you're talking about? Do you know who you, you used to call the thief? Wait, wait, tell me more about this thief. Imagine he didn't open it up. He, he didn't let them go. When they said, oh, he had a brother that was a thief too. He stole too. And he said to them, tell me more about this thief, brother of yours. What happened to him? I'd like to know. I hate thieves. He could have played him like that, right? I was actually reminded of a ridiculous story, but I'll tell you because this is important. What's dawning on them is really embarrassing. When I was in high school in 1875, I um, used to work in, uh, in New York in, in, in a small neighborhood called Junction Boulevard. It was predominantly, I don't know how it is now, but it was predominantly a Puerto Rican and Dominican neighborhood. And I used to take Spanish in high school. I was pretty good at Spanish. And I used to work in a Spanish neighborhood where I had to speak Spanish eight hours a day. So after school, I was selling shoes, you know, and, and like Tommy Hilfiger t-shirts and like Nikes and Jordans and, you know, Timberland boots and whatever. I was working at the shoe store eight, hour, eight, eight hours a day. And the majority of the customer base was Hispanic. And the entire neighborhood is predominantly Hispanic, Puerto Ricans and, and Dominicans, and sometimes Mexicans and others too. And they would actually get mad at you if you didn't speak Spanish. Like somebody would come in and say, Necesito size nueve. I need a size nine. And I'd say, I'm sorry, I don't understand. Could you explain that in English? I said, Vivos en los Estados Unidos. No hablas español. You live in America. You don't speak Spanish. They'd get mad. <laughs> right? So I got pretty decent at Spanish to the point where I would primarily talk to my co you know, colleagues, customers, whatever, in Spanish. And part of my job was the most annoying job. When you guys walk into a, a clothing store, you know the annoying guy that comes up, can I help you with something? Necesitas ayuda? So I was that guy. I had to go and ask, do you need any help? So this one time, and you know, if you're confused, I'm Pakistani. I'm extremely Pakistani. So I'm working at the store and these two Pakistani guys walk in, right? And they hear me talk to my friend in Spanish. And then I see these guys walk in, I run over and I say, uh, can I help you guys with something? And they start, kid you not, they start cussing me out in Urdu. Like, they're like, uh, no thanks. And they're like, yeah, and they start going off on me in Urdu, right? With a smile, like I won't know what they're saying because they think I only speak Spanish. So I was like, and they, let me translate what they said. This beep, 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 go help us. Please, <laughs> right? So I was like, I don't have to help you, but you don't have to curse. I said that in Urdu, like I said that in Urdu. And they're like, oh, oh, how we didn't know. We, we, we didn't know. Oh, oh, my, oh, my brother, brother. <laughs> I was like, it's okay, guys, just get your stuff. But you know, you're like, you're so outrageous and obnoxious and obscene and offensive, and you don't even know who you're offending. You don't realize that they've, you know, what you're doing. Isn't that what they did with Yusuf alayhi salam and way worse? Like they called him a thief to his face and his brother, which he knows isn't the case. And he's just listening to them quietly without calling them out. Right? So as this happens, and he says, I am Yusuf. It's not just I'm your little brother that you threw in a well. I, the minister of Egypt, the ultimate authority in this land that you came begging to, that you're standing before broken and starving, that's the Aziz is Yusuf. I am he and he is me. I am the minister is Yusuf. And by the way, this kid that you've been messing with for years, this kid that you've been abusing, this kid that you've hated because he was related to me, yeah, he's my brother. You know, when you, you first of all, you don't mess with a VIP and then you don't mess with a VIP's family, right? So when he, 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 obviously he's not saying this is my brother because they don't, oh, that's your brother? Oh, thanks for introducing us. They already know they brought him. So he's not saying this is my brother because he's introducing them. He's saying this is my brother as if to say, now what? No, try that stuff again. No, no, please. Go ahead. See what you want to do to us now. Because you hate both of us, right? You've hated us your whole lives. Well, here I am right in front of you. And this is my brother. Which you hate because you hate me so much. Now what? You see this confrontation? Ana Yusuf wahada akhi. This statement would like send shivers down the spine of the abuser. They're like shell shocked at the moment with just 
these two words. Now, scholars have tried to explain the this is my brother comment differently, right? I've tried to explain it as, you know, I'm telling you he's my brother because he's the brother of the minister of Egypt. So you better not lay a finger on him ever again. And you better think about what you've been doing to him because he's with me. But there's other explanations. The other explanations are مُبَالَغَةً فِي تَعْرِيفِ نَفْسِهِ As if he was going out of his way to make sure they recognize that it's him. No, it really is me. This is my brother. But I would argue that he doesn't need to go out of his way to convince them. And if he did, when you introduce yourself properly and you, you talk about who you really are, you attribute yourself to your father. I am Yusuf, son of Jacob. But he says, I am Yusuf and this is my brother. Your identity doesn't come from who your brother's with. Your identity comes from who your father. So that's a far more convincing argument, right? But that's not what he used. I'm Yusuf and this is my brother. Now, as they're hearing this, they're also thinking about man. So is he mad at us? He must be mad at us for what we did to him. But clearly he's probably going to be real mad at us for what we've been doing to his brother. That's why he brought him up. Oh, the kind of trouble we're in now. So they're, they're probably shaking at this point when he says, Hada akhi. But Yusuf السلام, didn't stop there. He didn't stop there. He says, Qad Allahu alayna. And this is where you find the remarkable character of Yusuf. السلام. Sabr, I, I brought this up throughout the series. Sabr is this pivotal concept in our religion, right? Patience, perseverance. And what it means And it has different dimensions it's, this, it's like this diamond that has different faces right? And all of them are sabr So sabr isn't one thing Sabr is lots of things But for today's discussion I want you to know that sabr One way of looking at it Is sabr is in a situation That is completely out of your control You got thrown in jail It's out of your control You're being falsely accused And you've been thrown You've been in prison without trial Out of your control you're a kid and you've been tossed in a well out of your control. You've lost your child and your sons won't tell you where he is out of your control. There's sabr in situations in which the circumstances are what? Out of your control. And then there is another kind of sabr. The other kind of sabr is when you have to act with restraint when you have power and you have control. And that one's harder. That one's harder. When you have the power to take revenge, when you have the power to say what you want, do what you want, and nobody's going to check you, nobody's going to put you in place because you have the right to and you have the power to, and you still act with restraint. Wait, but you have finally get a chance to dish out payback. Why would you hold back? Because in that moment, you realize that just like there was a situation in which you were powerless, there is an invisible reality before whom you are still powerless. And that's Allah. You recognize Allah's power over you even when you are in a position of power. And you hold yourself back from saying or doing what you could do, but you don't. Because you realize as big as you are in this situation As powerful as you are You may be the most powerful man in Egypt But you're not here because of you You don't have that power because of you That's also sabr Putting a check on your tongue On your hands, on your ability Because despite having the power to do so And what does Allah say about that kind of power? He describes in the Quran Sabr on different occasions But there's this phrase in the Quran uh, about sabr, right? And that is فَإِنَّ ذَلِكَ مِنْ عَزْمِ الْأُمُورِ So وَإِن تَصْبِرُوا وَتَتَّقُوا فَإِنَّ ذَلِكَ مِنْ عَزْمِ الْأُمُورِ If you can have sabr and you can have taqwa, that's one of the most amazing accomplishments in life. The phrase is إِنَّ ذَلِكَ مِنْ عَزْمِ الْأُمُورِ But in one place in Surah Al-Shura, Allah says وَلَمَنْ صَبَرَ وَغَفَرَ فَإِنَّ ذَلِكَ لَا مِنْ عَزْمِ الْأُمُورِ He went out of his way to emphasize this one place. He says. And whoever can have sabr and by way of that sabr forgive Then that is truly one of the greatest accomplishments Like that's a different level of sabr Because that's, that's in a passage where when you have the power to take revenge You can Allah gave you the right to Allah gave you the right to seek out justice 
If wrong was done to you, وَجَزَاءُ سَيِّئَةٍ سَيِّئَةٌ مِثْلُهَا When a wrong is done, its payback can be in equal measure. It can be. It's We're not a religion of turn the other cheek, though that's an option. We're a religion, I got slapped, I can slap you back. That, that's our religion. Eye for an eye. That's the old biblical law, actually. Eye for an eye. That's this religion. But Allah adds an incentive. But if you can, even though you have the right to take justice and take back what was taken from you, if you choose to forgive, then that's one of the most incredible accomplishments one can, one can achieve in their life. So here, what you find in the next words, because you know, once he says, I'm Yusuf and this is my brother. Now, if you put a stop there and put yourself in a situation like that, imagine it, this did not happen to Yusuf, this happened to you. Your brothers did this to you. You were in a well, you went all through all that stuff and now they're in front of you and they're powerless. Now what, huh? You like hitting me, right? You like throwing me in a well? Come, I made a well just for you guys. I made 10 wells just for each of you. Come on, nine wells. Let's go. Let's go. Let me show you how that feels. <laughs> the desire to make them feel what? You felt. Because you say in, my, in your head, I need you to feel what I felt. I need you to feel my pain. I need you to feel what it what it what it's like to be inside a jail. I need you to feel what it's like to be sold as a slave. I need you to feel this and feel this and feel this and feel this and feel this. And until I do, I feel like justice wasn't served. I he has a right to say any of this stuff, any of it. But he doesn't. He says something else entirely. He says, "Qad Allahu alayna." Allah certainly has favored both of us. Allah has certainly favored both of us. Who's both of us? Me and my little brother bin Yamin. Now what does he mean by Allah has favored both of us? There's lots of things this could mean. So let's go through them. One, this could mean, like Ibn Abbas says, بِكُلِّ عِزٍ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ Allah has favored both of us that we held on to our faith and dignity in this life and that will lead to the next. Meaning no matter what situation we found ourselves in, we held on to our faith and that's been Allah's favor on us. You people, and by the way, in that there's a subtle dig. It's a subtle comment. Allah favored us that we held on to faith and didn't let the devil take over unlike you guys. Now the unlike you guys has not been said, but said without being said, isn't it? It's a very dignified way of saying something to them without actually saying it, even though he has the power to. Allah favored us and we held on to our faith Unlike you who fell into the trick of shaitan He didn't give them a lecture You see that? He's not scolding them for what they did He just asked, do you, did you know what you did? That was just to, for the reveal But now that it's been revealed Now it's time for the real lecture I really need to talk to you, you ever, When you're hurt, you're like, I really need to talk to you I need to tell you something And then you're like Lay it all out And he's not laying it out, he says Allah has done us a favor. Now, what, what favor has Allah done to you and your brother? Well, one favor we held on to our faith. The second favor, bil jam'i baynana ba'da tafriqa. Allah has given us this amazing favor of, of uniting me with my brother after being apart for so long. Here they are criminalized and they stand indicted for what they've done and the charges have been levied and in this moment, Instead of his mind being focused on what they did wrong. And when you look at the past, you think about all the wrong that they did. His mind is now focused on the good that Allah has done, that my brother and I are together. Instead of focusing on so many years I didn't get to see my father. So many years I didn't get to see my brother. So many years he was abused. No, I'll focus on Allah has done us a favor. Allah made us reunited. You see the positive mindset of a believer? Even when you think about the past, you focus on, even though you don't, you don't, you don't disavow, you're not blind to the bad that happened. By the way, he did mention the bad that happened. Do you know what you did with Yusuf and his brother when you were jahil? That we already did this. So he's not blind, blind to the past. But when he brings up Allah and the past, he doesn't bring up what Allah did to him or allowed to happen to him that was bad. He says, Allah has done both of us a favor that He allowed us to be reunited in this way. Qad manallahu alayna. That's the second meaning. The third is that my brother and I actually have something in common. 
we found ourselves in circumstances that were out of our control. We found ourselves overpowered by oppression. And Allah made me come out of prison. And Allah made me come out of a well. Allah made me come out of dark situations, oppressive situations. And He gave me relief time and again. And here is my brother who was under your oppression for so many years. And Allah has given him relief too. We are both you know, grateful to Allah for the favor of relief He gave to both of us. Our relief is different, but nonetheless, it is relief that came from Allah to both of us. We are now both relieved. Let's get more direct. Allah has done a favor to both of us could also mean Allah has finally given us a favor, meaning He has favored us over you. Finally, we have the upper hand. We're not the little brothers that get beat up. You're the big brothers that are on your knees. Allah has given us a favor and finally given us the advantage over you. But you see, even if you say that, I had to say that in English by saying, Allah has given us the upper hand over you. But not only did they not use preference, Allah has preferred us over you. Because he could have said, Faddalallahu, Faddalanallahu alaykum. Allah has favored us over you. Like Allah uses for the Israelites, Faddaltukum ala al I favored you over all the other nations, like he says about the Israelites. That's not the language he used. He just said, Allah has favored us. Now you could understand that has favored us over you, but that would be too mean of him to say. Even in this time, he's not going to say something that will poke at his brothers. Even in this time. They did what they did. And they deserve to hear that. But he's not going to bring his moral standards down. His manners and speech, his class, the class with which he speaks, the upper, you know, the, the, the moral upper hand with which he speaks will not decline. So he says, Manallahu alayna, even though it's implied. And because when they're hearing it, yeah, he has favored you over us, clearly. But the, he didn't have to say the over us, they'll think it. And by the way, in the next ayah, which we'll talk about tomorrow, inshallah, you'll see, Atharakallahu alayna, God has given you preference over us. They'll say it. <laughs> he didn't say it though. It's pretty epic. So now, finally, him, th this is probably to me the most profound of the thoughts uh, regarding Allah has favored both of us. Let's take a step back and understand the social circumstances and the worldly circumstances of Yusuf compared with his younger brother, Binyamin. Yusuf is the, for all practical purposes, the king of Egypt. For all practical purposes He's running the country Yeah, He's the Al-Aziz The ultimate authority His brother comes from a starving family Where he's been beat up by his older brothers And socially speaking They have nothing in common Economically speaking They are worlds apart Opportunity wise They are worlds apart Even the food they get to put in front of them On a daily basis They are worlds apart Aren't they? And yet the king and the starving Canaanite are being merged together in a sentence by Yusuf when he says, Allah has favored both of us. You see, with our worldly eyes, you see a millionaire, man, that person's blessed. You see a homeless person, that person is not blessed. The healthy is blessed. The sick isn't blessed. Some people Allah has favored with appearance. Some people Allah has favored with money. Some people Allah has favored with family. Some people, Allah has favored people with different things. And there are other people that are deprived of those things. Yet there is there seems to be a standard in the mind and the heart of Yusuf alayhi salam, which makes him see that Allah's favor is something me and my brother have in common. You know what that why that's remarkable? He understands Allah's favor not in materialistic terms. He doesn't just see Allah's favor as kingdom that was given to him Though that is Allah's favor He doesn't just see Allah's favor as Relief that was given to him after being slandered That's not the only favor of Allah The favor above all the other favors Is the first favor I started with Which is Allah allowed us to hold on to our faith No matter what life looked like no matter what clothes we wore No matter what kind of house we lived in Whether my surroundings Everything around me was a wall, was a well or a prison cell or a castle. Whether the, the, the backgrounds changed, but Allah's favor remained. 
It's to me incredible that these words are coming out of his mouth as he sits on the throne. And almost ident identical in meaning words came out of his mouth when he was in prison. This is the favor of Allah on us and on people. Right? Allah favor you, you talked about how Allah has favored you in jail. And now you're talking about how Allah favored you here And you don't see a difference in how Allah favored you And how Allah favored your brother Though you are materialistically worlds apart But you see that as Allah's favor Meaning Allah's favor is not to be looked at With a material lens alone And by the way, the, the material lens alone can be very deceiving What is worldly life except very little And then Allah says you know, illa um, mata'ul ghurur. This is just means of, you know, mata'ul ghurur means this is means by which people are deceived. There's somebody could have a lot of money and they're not favored by Allah. Somebody could have nothing and they're incredibly favored by Allah. There's a woman that the Prophet ﷺ used to see cleaning, old woman used to clean the masjid. Nobody knew her name. One day she stopped coming. When she passes away, the Prophet ﷺ cries for her. She's wealthier on Judgment Day than any billionaire or trillionaire that will ever walk this earth because she has on her side the tears of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Who gets that? Who, who gets that kind of mention? That his heart went out for her. Radiallahu anha. We don't even know her name, but I can guarantee you she'll be a big celebrity on Judgment Day. Allah has favored her. Allah has given us a favor So this is the statement that he makes to his brothers Ibn Ashur Actually thinks and I agree with him That he knew that this is going to be a pivotal Breaking point for his brothers When, it, when they realize that I am, I am Their brother then they are going to be Humbled like they have never been humbled before In their life and this moment is a very Life changing moment for them So I'm going to use this moment To say something to them That will actually stick with them Later on, you know, when you're, when you're in a certain moment, the iron is hot, that's the time to strike, right? Now it could be, that's the time where you want to say what you've been wanting to say. But no, this is the time where I'm going to say what they need to hear. They need to hear something to better themselves. I will say something that's been in my heart, but I won't let that override the need to benefit them. Because I remember something my father told me in his mind. A long time ago, they're not my enemy, shaitan is. Shaitan got them to do something. And I'm going to recognize that and I'm going to try to get them out of the out of the, the wool that shaitan has pulled over their eyes. I want to remove that veil for them. So the way he speaks now after قَدْ مَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَيْنَا He says, إِنَّهُ مَنْ يَتَّقِي وَيَصْبِرْ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُضِيعُ أَجْرَ الْمُحْسِنِينَ Certainly the person who can have taqwa, who can be mindful and protective of Allah, وَيَصْبِرْ and persevere, then certainly Allah does not waste the reward of those who do the ver their very best, those who excel. This is the statement that he makes. It's a very loaded statement. Let's take this piece by piece. First of all, I can Yusuf is saying, as, as if Yusuf is saying, I have lived a life where I have experienced that there were situations where there were impulses inside me that in, exist inside any human being that could have taken over, but something more powerful inside me that, that imp, than that impulse was the taqwa of Allah. And because of that taqwa of Allah, I was able to persevere. And no matter what trouble came my way, I was able to persevere. Because once you show taqwa, life gets tough. And when life gets tough, you have to persevere. And if you can do those two, two things, I know one thing in my life itself is testimony that there's definitely the fact that Allah, He does not re let go to waste the, the reward He's going to give to those who excel, those who do their best. He will not let that go. In a sense, He's also saying, I wish you guys had taqwa. I, I wish when you had these thoughts about my dad and how lost he is, even though you know he's a prophet, I wish you thought about how when you when you thought that dad is unfair that he loves me more and I was just a child. That before you before you realize this is some evil thoughts you have towards me, you should have realized you're not mindful of Allah when you entertain thoughts like that. That somebody who has taqwa of Allah can't be thinking negative and twisted thoughts like that. 
Astaghfirullah al-Azim. La tatamannaw ma faddalallahu bihi ba'dakum ala ba'd. Allah says, don't wish for some favor Allah has given over others. You would have had taqwa of Allah and said, whether dad, I, we feel dad loves us more or not, what's most important is, can we stand before Allah? We have to face him. How can we even entertain a thought like killing our brother and we have to stand in front of Allah one day? Where was your taqwa? I see your emotions of jealousy and this and that and the other. And by the way, if, if in the end of the day, if there, this was hatred towards your fellow brother because you feel that he's being given preferential treatment, didn't you realize that's exactly the feelings of shaitan? And you should have had taqwa and understood that Allah, ta Allah taught you that shaitan's your enemy and those feelings come from your enemy. Why do you want to see another person in harm and somehow feel that's going to benefit you? That, that's just shaitan. That I wish you had taqwa at the time. And if you had had taqwa, then you could have been able to, even if you had bad feelings, you would have been able to keep them in check and you would have been patient with them. And you would have dealt with them in a, you know, better ways. You would have had sabr. We, my brother and I, have lived a life of taqwa and sabr. And I can tell you whoever does that, Allah will not waste their compensation. And whoever doesn't, by implication, they'll have to pay for it eventually. And here you are, look at how you're paying for it. Look at the position you find yourselves in. Do I, did I want you to be in this position? Did I want you to be embarrassed? That's inside for إِنَّهُ مَنْ يَتَّقِي وَيَصْبِرْ They say, they, you know, I, I, I thought this too, that you know when he says, Allah has favored us, when he said in the previous statement, قَدْ مَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَيْنَا And the very, very next statement is إِنَّهُ مَنْ يَتَّقِي وَيَصْبِرْ This could be jumla تَعْلِيلِيَا Which is what Ibn Ashur suggests تَعْلِيلٌ لِجُمْلَةِ مَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَيْنَا Allah has favored us because we held on to taqwa and we, we demonstrated sabr. That's why Allah favored us. Allah gave us this upper hand for that reason. حَثَّهُمْ عَلَى التَّقْوَى وَالتَّعَلُّقِ بِالصَّبْرِ And it also seems to suggest, and this is also kind of Subtly indicative by the present tense use because the conditional statements in Arabic can be إِنَّهُ مَنْ اتَّقَى وَصَبَرَ But مَنْ يَتَّقِي وَيَصْبِرْ can also be a subtle nudge towards the future meaning even if you've lived a life without taqwa much and without sabr much doesn't mean that your lives are over you can still have taqwa and sabr and Allah will not reward your good deeds in other words you will not be judged by your previous mistakes by Allah People may look at you and all they will remember is the mistakes you made in the past Allah doesn't work that way. If you show Allah taqwa and sabr, Allah will not let go of your good deeds. And you know what? Here's the other important thing here. He's now almost motivating his brothers to start a new life without even him saying it yet. In the words, إِنَّهُ مَنْ يَتَّقِي وَيَصْبِرْ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُضِيعُ أَجْرَ الْمُحْسِنِينَ I need you to know, Allah will not let that go. Allah will not let that go to waste. And I know something about not letting something go to waste. He's, he's had an entire country work on the farm so that the crop doesn't go to waste. And he understands how things don't go to waste in the material world when you work hard. And he also understands that things don't go to, to waste in the spiritual world when you do the spiritual hard work. Just like there's work on the farm, and you get the crop, and you have to persevere, and you have to have patience, and you have to hold the crop back, and not eat too much, and have sabr, and then you'll survive the next seven years. Just like that, in your spiritual life, you have to have taqwa, and you have to have sabr, and when you have these two things, then you will get the reward if you did well. He, it's, it's as if he understands how the world works, how the seen world works, and how the unseen world works both at the same time. It's so beautiful. He's, a, he's an economic leader, he's a political leader, he's a social leader, and he's a spiritual leader. All in one. And for someone to say that from uh, uh, the pulpit, from, the, from you know, the masjid, for someone to say that in a spiritual talk is something else. For the leader of a nation to say that and say that by living that example is a different level. Man, that's a, just a different level of leadership. And he's saying that to his brothers in this way, إِنَّهُ مَنْ يَتَّقِي وَيَصْبِرْ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُضِيعُ أَجْرَ الْمُحْسِنِينَ There's the other interesting thing. <clears throat> you saw a couple of ayat ago, إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَجْزِي الْمُتَصَدِّقِينَ The brother said, certainly Allah gives, this is at the end of ayah number 88. Allah says, certainly Allah gives, uh, rewards those who give charity, who are charitable. Certainly Allah rewards those who are charitable. And here he says, Allah does not waste 
the reward of those who do excellently. Yeah? So you've got two interesting contrasting phrases. You've got Allah rewards in the Allah Yajzi, and you've got Allah does not waste the compensation. Which practically means the same thing, right? At the end of the day, you're going to get what Allah wants to give you. He will reward you. But one way of saying it is Allah will reward you, compensate you. And the other is Allah will not waste your compensation. Right? So why use the positive language? Allah will reward. And then you also find the negative language. Allah will not put to waste. What's the, the subtle contrast between them? When you give charity, you're doing something good. Yes? When you're doing something good, then the positive verb, Allah will compensate the positive corresponds with the positive, right? But when you fight hard to do to not do something bad, because at the end of the day, what's taqwa? When is taqwa most important? Taqwa is most important when in front of you there's a choice to disobey Allah. There's a, there's a magnetic pull towards the wrong thing. Speech, action, you name it. Whatever the cause may be, whatever the appetite may be, it's calling you away from obeying Allah And that is when this force of taqwa stops you It prevents you from going and fulfilling what you wanted otherwise That's what taqwa does Actually I'll explain another way of looking at taqwa and sabr today too Think of it this way There are, neg there are evil tendencies inside us There are, Allah put explosive fuel inside a human being he put it inside us. Now that, that stuff inside us, these impulses, these urges, these you know, desires, these greeds, they want to let out. They want to do what they want to do. And taqwa will be the force that will control you from letting that loose. It will put that in check. That's what taqwa does. So these things are a force, and taqwa is a greater force. It suppresses or controls these forces So they can only be released in ways that please Allah It's like floodwaters that want to destroy a city And taqwa comes and puts gates And says no water can only go from this channel And this channel and this channel When you let it go from the proper channels Farms will be irrigated People will have water to drink The city will be replenished If you open up the gates or you destroy the gates The city gets flooded And that's the, basically our soul When you allow those desires to come out in, from the halal avenues Then your life will be replenished with blessings When you don't exert, you know, exhibit taqwa And you let loose It'll destroy you from the inside it, It's a flood on the inside It wrecks you from the inside That's basically the philosophy of taqwa okay? So what I'm getting at Let's get to the point Taqwa is restraint over the tendencies That are inside you, yes? Sabr is what? Sabr is restraint over situations outside of you. Sabr is what people said to you, you need sabr. The things that happen to you, you need sabr. The, the circumstances need sabr. So taqwa protects you from, and by the way, those, those things from the outside can make you do wrong. Or make you lose your faith. And to hold on to your faith while things are going bad, the evil is coming to you from the outside, that's when you need sabr. And when your inside is calling you to do something wrong And you put that down That's what? Taqwa If you can't win the battle inside You cannot win the battle outside You get it? So what is the sequence? Whoever has taqwa And whoever has sabr Whoever wins the battle on the inside with taqwa And whoever can win the battle on the outside with what? Sabr, these are the two battles, aren't they? The inside battle and the outside battle Just like Surah Al-Falaq and Surah Al-Nas it's, it's the same thing So that's one, yet another way of looking at taqwa and sabr Now why is that important? Because in this phrase Yusuf a.s. has given us a statement That is not just limited to this story It is a universal Axiom. Let me. If you, some younger audiences they don't know what an axiom is, so let me put that in simple words. You know, like there are certain rules, like gravity, the rule of gravity, the law of gravity, right? And it always applies when, you, so long as you're on planet Earth, it applies a certain way, right? Or acceleration due to gravity is nine point eight something meters per second square, etc. That those are rules. Or fire burns is a is a law, natural law. Just like that, there are spiritual laws. So. Just like if you're going to, you know, 
start, a, you know, put paper in front of a fire, it's going to set on fire. It's always every time that's going to happen because that's just the way things are. Just like that in, sp in the spiritual world, in your spiritual life, there are certain realities. It will always be that way. What's that reality? That reality is that if you have sabr, if you have taqwa and you have sabr, then one thing's for sure. Allah considers you from the muhsineen. Now this is a heavy thing I'm just saying. So I'm going to take pause and help you understand something. The highest rank of a believer that can be achieved. There's The hadith of Jibreel tells us that you can be Muslim. You can be mu'min, a believer. Muslim, someone who surrenders to Allah. Meaning they just accepted the faith. Mu'min, someone who has faith in their heart. A step above. Muhsin is the highest state you can be. And what's ihsan? Ihsan is an ta'bud Allah ka annaka tarahu fa illam takun tarahu fa innahu yaraka. You worship Allah as if you can see Him, and if you don't see Him, at the very least, you always recognize that He sees you, right? That's the highest state of a believer. Like we want to be from the muhsinin. That's like the highest state we can have. Now, in this ayah, what does Allah say? Whoever has taqwa and sabr, Allah does not waste the reward of those who have taqwa and sabr. He didn't say that. Listen again. If you have taqwa, I will reward you for having taqwa. If you have sabr, I will reward you for having sabr. That's not what he said. He said, if you have taqwa and sabr, I will reward those who are muhsineen. In other words, when you have both of these things, I consider you what? Muhsineen. You do A and B, taqwa plus sabr equals ihsan. That's the equation. You can be those two, I will consider you muhsineen, the highest rank a believer can have. Why? Go back to the Prophet's definition, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu says, you worship Allah as though you can what? See Him. And if not, you are always aware that He sees you. Well, let's go back to the definition of taqwa. One of the ways I described it to you is, taqwa is you fighting the evil forces inside you, right? And what's going to help you fight those evil forces? Allah is watching. Isn't that what taqwa is? It's as if you can see Allah before you see the evil in front of you. It puts a stop to you. It just puts a stop to you. Then on the other side, you've got sabr. Sabr is circumstances outside difficulty, people's words, circumstances, difficulties, trials, etc., etc. But when you see them from ihsan, what's sabr? These trials are coming from Allah. Allah knows what I'm going through. And I know Allah does not waste the reward. That comes from, from carrying myself right in the circumstance. I will hold on. I will hold my tongue not because this person deserves it. Because Allah will give me. Isn't that sabr? That's why taqwa and sabr are actually ihsan. Speaking along these lines. Um, he says, the, you know, taqwa here means to avoid zina. To get away from zina, and sabr here means to be to to be content or be hold yourself with restraint while you remain single. He says, uh, Ar Razi says, uh, taqwa here means avoiding sins, and sabr here means you know bearing the harsh hardship people give you, bearing the hardships that people give you. إنه ما يتقي ويصبر فإن الله لا يضيع أجر المحسنين. So now, as I've you know, I, I try to wrap this up. Just appreciate what Yusuf alayhi salam has said, but more importantly, appreciate what Yusuf alayhi salam did not say. Because a lot could have been said. A lot could have been. He could have said, where was your taqwa? Where was your sabr? How do you call yourselves Muslim? How do you how do you not disgrace the honor of the of being privileged children of, of the Prophet Yaqub, of the grandchildren of Ishaq, great grandchildren of Ibrahim alayhi salam? How do you call yourselves Muslim? How could you have done this? None of it. There's none of it. I mean, nobody, I'm pretty sure nobody can give a better lecture than a prophet. Right? If somebody wants to give somebody a lecture, they'd give the best ones. And yet he takes this. Really dignified road. He doesn't even say, I had taqwa, I had sabr, Allah rewarded me. He didn't say that. He said, Whoever does it, as if 
He's not even directly talking about himself, though obviously he's included. But he's like, this is an open invitation. Anybody's in, anybody's welcome. Even you, even now. Even you, even now. And this is reminding me of his words back then in prison. This is a favor Allah has given to us and He's given to people. He's extended the offer to humanity. Anybody can take advantage. This is Him telling His brothers, no matter what wrong you've done to me and how much hurt it's caused me and my brother, and He's told me all about it. Now I know. And God knows what kind of trouble you've caused my father. I can be angry with you all I want. I still don't want you to burden hell. My anger has limits. Allah's punishment has no limits. That's Khalidi Nafiha Abada. I can't, my grudge against you doesn't make me say, I'll see you on judgment day. Or Allah's wrath is on you. I'll tell you in this moment where you feel like I will come at you with revenge. Or you're preparing yourself to hear me yell at you and you say, sorry, 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 we're so sorry, I can't believe we did this. You're preparing yourself for your apologies. You don't need to. You need to, You. I don't need your apology. I need your redemption. And you need it more than I do. You need to come, come, come back to Allah. It's basically an invitation back to Allah before anything else. The last discussion that I want to have with you about this is actually a heavy one, but an important one. And I think because we're, we're so deep into this conversation now, I'd, you know, I'd rather uh, uh, deal with that now. This surah is unique in the Quran because it um, time and again describes that if you are patient and you do good, that you will things will work out for you in the end, in this life. And there are two views. When you do good, it doesn't matter if you get rewarded in this life or not because Allah has recorded it for you and you will get it in the afterlife anyway. Is that a fact? Yes. Are there people who do a lot of good and they get nothing in this life and they die? And their only reward will come in the afterlife. Is that Does that happen? Absolutely. Are there people that are innocent and have been imprisoned or killed and they will get Jannah with Allah? Yeah, that happens too. So there are two conflicting outcomes. If I'm being taught, if you do good and you excel, that Allah will take care of you where? In this life, it's going to work out. Just like we learn in the story of, of Yusuf a.s. But we also have the conflicting account, which is there are people that have done plenty of good and they never saw the reward for that in this life. Their reward is only with Allah Azza wa Jal. That's also a reality. And we're being taught both of these apparently contradicting realities in the Qur'an. First and foremost, let's understand that. The Qur'an does not endorse either view exclusively. The Qur'an refuses to give the claim that if you do good, you will only get rewarded in the afterlife. That claim is denied. The Qur'an also refuses the claim that if you do good, you will absolutely get rewarded in this life. It also rejects that claim. So what is the claim of the Qur'an? The claim of the Qur'an is, you are a slave, know your place. And you are a creature of hope. And you know what? No, We can philosophize about this all we want. But the case study and the, the way the Qur'an teaches deep philosophical messages is by way of case studies. And the case study for someone who has both worlds in front of him, hope of this life, hope of the next life, is Yaqub a.s. Like he is the ultimate example in the Qur'an of someone who has complete reliance on Allah and yet at the same time is hopeful things will work out in this life. He doesn't, he doesn't say to himself, well, if I lost my child, I see him in Jannah. Why do you believe in the Akhirah? Why are you crying? Your child, is, if he died, he's in Jannah. And if he's going through trials, Allah is going to reward him. It's no big deal. You know, when people have that kind of mentality, don't worry about it. It's in the Akhirah. It's okay. Really give that lecture to Yaqub a.s. Because <laughs> he's crying over what's happening in this life. And he, while he believes in the afterlife, what is Allah telling us? Allah is telling us He created us with hopes in this world too. With aspirations in this world too. He wants us to desire the next life. But He doesn't want us to forgo this life. He wants us to beg Him. By the way, do we have a guarantee of the Akhirah? 
we don't know where we stand, right? We don't, Muslims are not like Christians. Christians can say we have a guarantee. You know, we've got the ticket. We have salvation. Muslims will never say, I, you know, I don't know about you, but I got salvation. I'm good. On judgment day, I'm going to be in the VIP section. That's not Muslims. We beg Allah to not include us among, among al maghdub alayhim and al-dalin in every single salah because we are in danger of being one of those two every few hours and in between. There's a reason we ask for that in the Fatiha. Because our guidance is not guaranteed. Our salvation is not guaranteed. That is only by the mercy and, and, and wisdom of Allah Azza wa and His, and his, his uh, forgiveness granted on us. I would argue just like we have no guarantees, we don't know what's going to happen to us in the afterlife. But are we always hopeful? Are we supposed to be hopeful while being fearful? Yeah. You can't just be fearful and you can't just be Hopeful. It is the same exact attitude Allah taught us in this world. Yusuf Alayhi's father can be deeply sad and completely hopeful in this life at the same time. Can't he? Just like a believer, when it comes to the afterlife, can be utterly afraid and completely hopeful with Allah. At the same time, these contradictory forces balance each other out like two wings on a bird. Just like that is the case for the afterlife, that is the case for this life. I'm supposed to have hope. I'm supposed to have hope I'll have a better relationship with my children. Or things will work out with my parents. Or things will work out in my marriage. Or things will work out with this friend of mine that I've lost touch with. Or etc. Cetera, et cetera. I'm supposed to have hope that financial difficulties will go away. Or the diagnosis will be cleared. Or the, you know, the cancer will go away. Or whatever. I'm supposed to have that hope. I'm supposed to. And at the same time I have the fears. And when I have that hope, I come in front of Allah, not with guarantee. Ya Allah, you said if I pray, Allah, you'll remove my cancer. Allah never said that. Allah said He won't re waste your reward. And He might reward me in this life. Why should I think that He won't? Because He, di he, didn't, say guarantee, he didn't guarantee that He will, but He didn't guarantee that He won't. He wants me to beg. He wants me to see humbled. And this is the, the why I refer to Yaqub alayhi salam is look at he wanted to protect his kids when they were going back into Egypt. And he said, go from different doors, right? Okay, that's him worried about this life at the end of the day. Well, however you interpret it, evil eye or not, I owe you that lecture. But evil eye or not, it is concerned with this life and their safety in this life. But immediately after, what does he say? Listen, if Allah has another plan, I can't do anything about that, but I can put my complete trust in Him. Hope in Allah and trust in Allah at the same time. And uh, the hope can be dictated by my feelings. My feelings, are, my hope is my family is reunited. That's my hope. That's Yaqub Islam's hope. My family is reunited. And, but at the same time, there's a trust in Allah that if that, reun that reunion doesn't happen this month, this year, 10 years from now, or it never happens, or it happens three generations from now, then if that is the case, I trust Allah more than I trust my feelings. Balancing both of those. Now why is, why if you lose that balance, why is that a problem? Like this is, has to be understood. There could be that people are doing wrong to you, and when you speak up, they say you should have sabr because your reward is in the akhirah. Why are you complaining about your state? Because believers should be grateful and believers should have sabr. Yeah, you should have sabr like you, Yaqub alayhi salam and then say go look for Yusuf. <laughs> if you just want to have sabr, Allah has done what he's done, then you don't have to go look for nothing. Allah will reunite me on judgment day, it's okay. That's not Yaqub alayhi salam. He understands, and when Yusuf, why did I bring all this up? Yusuf alayhi salam here says, whoever has taqwa and has sabr, Allah does not waste the reward of those who do their best, yes? So in my case, Allah even gave me that reward in this life. And I was hopeful for it. And my father's hopeful for it. Why shouldn't I hope for better in this life? Why do I go in the one place where I'm supposed to forget about this world? Go in front of Allah's house, in the most harsh climate on earth, go to the Kaaba and walk around in clothes that mimic the nothingness of Judgment Day, right? And I'm, as, I, as I pass Rukun Yamani, I say, Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adab Our master give us beautiful good things in this life and good beautiful good things in the next life. 
Why only ask? Just you went there, man. Ask for akhirah. Hajj is supposed to be a simulation of Judgment Day, a massive gathering of people that are basically the same level. All of them standing before Allah in the field of Arafah, <laughs> right? It's supposed to be a simulation of Judgment Day. Forget this world, but no. Laisa alaykum junahun an tabtawu fadla min rabbikum. It's okay. There's no harm for on you if you go take some things to sell and make some money when you go to Hajj too. Huh? Huh? What? This life? Yep. Our religion is about balancing the the needs and wants of this life and channeling them in a way that Allah is pleased with, so you can have the best of both worlds. Our religion is about both worlds. And when you become just from the other world, you say, I only want my reward in the akhirah, then you become complacent, paralyzed in this world. Then you cannot even, then you are not able to stand up for yourself. And more importantly, you're not able to stand up for anyone else. Because when someone else is fighting for their rights, you say, no, no, no don't worry, you'll get your rights on akhirah. Then you become complacent and you become a cause of injustice in the name of tawakkul. That's not this religion And on the flip side When you say I want all of my rewards here I asked Allah to give me A hundred on my math exam And here I am getting an F How did this happen? I made so much dua Yeah you made tahajjud And you made dua but you didn't study for your test Maybe you should have been doing that more And tahajjud a little less Because that's how that works It's not Angel's not going to come in and fill in your multiple choice questions bro that's not how that works. But when you don't get things working out for you in this life, then you start blaming Allah and saying, well, what's the point? Allah is not rewarding me in this life. Those are the two extremes. One losing faith and the other losing sight of they have a purpose in this life too. They have things to accomplish in this life too. And we carry both with us. Just like we do for the akhirah, just like we do in this dunya. That's the balance that the believer has to strike And that's the balance that's been beautifully struck in this surah Described in this surah well, This surah has told us People could think that you're crazy That things are going to work out Have hope No, you're not crazy You're supposed to have hope And you're supposed to work towards it Whatever means you can Relentless, fanatical hope Be, be like psychotic in the hope you have in Allah No problem be, be unreasonable in the hope you have in Allah That Allah will make things come to light Allah will make things happen for you Don't let the worldly limitations define your optimism That's part of the surah How could it be? This humanly impossible to imagine A kid thrown in a well will run Egypt A foreigner A foreigner thrown in a well will run Egypt this is like Beyond fathom and some kid who's a slave And some guy in a jail cell Is going to run this country <laughs> If somebody in a jail cell says, You know I'm going to run this country one day <laughs> Yeah yeah Mr. President Just hold on <laughs> this, the, Allah's plan is beyond human fathom We cannot contain it in our imagination And in our calculations So this is part of It's a timeless message of hope Allah will not let our good deeds go to waste And what I wanted to say, the contrast good, The good verb, reward for charity But when you avoid becoming bad And you avoid doing bad By, by taqwa and sabr Then Allah avoids wasting your deeds Right? So Because when you, when you hold on to taqwa You deprived yourself from something haram So you feel like you missed out when you have sabr, you feel like you missed out from saying something you could have said. Some vengeance you could have taken. You know, so sabr and taqwa make you feel like you missed out on something. And Allah says, you missed out on nothing. The compensation you're going to get, I will never let that go to waste. You didn't waste any opportunity. You didn't miss an opportunity. You gained an opportunity. May Allah Azza wa Jal make us all people of sabr and taqwa and overlook our past mistakes. May Allah Azza wa Jal allow us to Come to terms with the wrongs that we've done You see Yusuf alayhi salam's brothers They had to get hit real hard before they wake up Real hard The trickle trickle wasn't working They had to get some Some people just have to hit, get hit real hard Before the realization hits them And now that these words have come out of Yusuf alayhi salam And he's confronted them directly And he's given them this one line sermon I can't wait to see what they have to say Tomorrow
ان شاء الله بارك الله لي ولكم والسلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته اي جوت ايت